All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be here with you in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, if you're looking for a slightly taller guy with a man bun, he is not here uh, this morning. Uh, The Haygoods are off enjoying their time in Hawaii. And when the Haygoods are away, that means I get the opportunity to preach a lesson from the scriptures. And it is just a great opportunity. I love being up here. I love getting to talk to you guys about just important things in our faith, important things going on uh, in Christianity. And it is just really a great opportunity to be here with you. Uh, So this morning, what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be talking about faith. Uh, Faith is an interesting thing because it's a word that we use a lot. We say, have faith. Just put your faith in such and such. But one of the things that we don't often talk about is, well, what does faith really mean? What does faith look like? And how do we implement faith into our own lives? Who are we putting our faith in? I want to start off the sermon this morning with a picture. And I think this picture very accurately represents what faith can feel like a lot of the time. A lot of the times when we have faith and we're putting our faith in something, it feels like we're on this tightrope, right? And we're walking across this great divide and we have a a little bit of uh, safety, right? We have this safety harness that we put on. We have this rope. But a lot of the times it kind of just feels like we're up there by ourselves, right? We don't really know what's going on. We don't really have this vision or this direction of where things are going, and it can be really scary sometimes, right? This whole concept of faith can feel a lot like this, and I think it's something that if we really start to think a little bit more about, it really helps us to define what faith is. It's really interesting. A couple weeks ago, I did the same lesson for our youth rally, um, and I asked the kids, I said, what is the definition of faith? And I was very shocked because the kids did a great job of defining faith. They had a great hold on what faith really is. And I was actually expecting them to answer in a way that would allow me to kind of correct how they view faith. But they proved me wrong, which is great. The kids of our congregation and the youth of other congregations are on the right path when it comes to understanding what faith is. Now, I love that In order to define faith, we can actually turn to the scriptures because the scriptures give us a great definition of what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, it says this, it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, right? We can have confidence in the things that we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So we have confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. This is what scripture defines as faith faith. But let me put it this way. More simply put, faith is trusting in something that you cannot empirically prove. Now, empirically, that's just basically a scientific word. That means things that you can see, touch, taste, hear, feel. It's your senses, right? So what are we talking about with faith, it's something that you cannot empirically prove, right? We can't prove the existence of God scientifically, but we see the proof of God all around us, right? The things that God has created. And this helps us to put our faith in him. Now, faith is an interesting thing because faith requires two things from us. First, faith requires us to have intellectual assent. What does this mean? Basically, it means believing something to be true. Now, this is interesting because this is not necessarily the part that defines our faith, right? Because we can believe in Santa Claus. We can believe in the Easter Bunny. We could believe in the Tooth Fairy. But it's this second part, right? The second part of faith is trust, right? Actually relying on the fact that something is true. As kids, we might believe in the tooth fairy, we might believe in Santa Claus, but our, our being does not rely on the fact that these are true things. You see, let me put it this way. Imagine a chair. It can be any chair. It could be a chair in the back of the auditorium. It could be an armchair, anything. But 
to help us visualize this a little bit better, what it boils down to is intellectual assent, right? Would be recognizing the chair is a chair and agreeing that it is designed to support a person who sits on it, right? It's something that we know, something that we believe to be true, right? Now, the second part of that is actually trusting the chair and actually sitting in it, right? We can know that the chair is a chair and agree that people should sit on it, but if we don't actually sit in the chair, then what good is knowing that the chair is a chair, do you see where I'm going with this? It's both and. You have to both have intellectual assent, believing that something is true, and trusting, relying on the fact that that thing is true. So, biblical faith requires us not just to know the facts about God, but to trust fully in Him. You can know the Scriptures, you can know the facts. You can have a fact sheet and just sit there and read off the facts about God, right? Scripture tells us a lot of things about God. But the difference where faith truly comes in is when you trust fully in him. When you put your faith in God, this is where faith comes from. It's the trust. Let me share something with you that I think is really hard sometimes to hear. James chapter 2, verse 19. Look at what James says. He says, You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So let's ask a hard question. What makes us different than the demons, right? If the demons know who God is, even the demons have that intellectual assent, then what is it that makes us different in our faith? It's the trust. Because remember, when Jesus encounters demon-possessed people in the New Testament, they always know who he is. They always point to the fact that he is God, and they are afraid of the power that he wields. They know that. So if we know that, that's great. But what makes us different? It is trust. So to truly have faith in God, we have to both believe in him, and rely on the fact that he is God. It's reliance. It's trust. Right? It's both and. It's having both of these things, not one or the other. So what does this mean for us as Christians? How should we respond to understanding this definition of faith? Well, you see, as Christians, we should first believe what the Bible says and obey it. Secondly, we should believe the promises of God and live accordingly. And third, we should agree with the truth of God's word and be transformed by it. So this, this is a quick run through of the definition of faith that I think is really important for us to understand. But let me ask you a second question. So we now understand faith a little bit better and we as Christians put our faith in God, but... Why should we trust in God? It's really easy to get up here and to say, this is what faith is. Put your trust in God and everything will be great. But it's one thing to say, well, what is, what is it about God that makes him worthy of putting our trust in? Bob read for us earlier during the scripture reading, uh, Exodus 34, verses 5 through 8, right? God tells us exactly who he is, right? He lays it out. He says, I am slow to anger, abounding in love. My love goes for thousands of generations, but my anger ends after three or four generations. He's saying, look, this is who I am. This is me. I am God. Now, God doesn't have to tell us who he is, but he wants us to know that he is loving, and in a relationship, it goes both ways, right? Right? You can't ask someone to be in a relationship with you if they don't know who you are. But more importantly, you can't be in a healthy relationship if you don't trust in who that person is. It's both and. But let's dive into this question, right? Well, let's look at a man by the name of Abraham. Now, many of you have probably heard the story of Abraham, know a little bit about him, but one of the things that I don't know if we talk a lot about is the fact that Abraham is often referred to as the father of our faith. 
Well, how did Abraham get that title? Why do people look back at Abraham and say, this is the man that our faith began with? Well, you see, God makes a promise to Abraham. And in this promise, we start to realize and see that God is faithful, is trustworthy in his promises. Let me share this promise with you in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Let's go ahead and read this together. It says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, if you notice, there's only verses 1 through 3 on the screen, and I've intentionally done that uh, to have verse 4 on its own slide. But let's look at this for a second, right? So God comes to Abraham. At this time, he's known by the name Abram. And he says, you know what? I want you to leave your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Now, let me stop there for a second. So Abraham knows who God is, right? He believes in God. God has approached Abraham. He knows who God is. Now the question is, does Abraham have trust in God? Right, because if someone came up to you and said, hey, I want you to leave the land that you've lived in probably your entire life, your people, I want you to take everyone and I want you to go to this land that I'm going to show you. I want you to trust God in me, and I want you to truly believe that what I'm saying is going to be a good thing. Now, if you ask me that, I would say, that's nice, but who, like, why would I do that? Why would I give up everything that I have known in order to go to a place that I don't know and to a land with people that I don't know? I don't even know if I go there if these people will receive me. You know, it's interesting because my response is very different than what Abraham's response is. Look at what Abraham does. In verse 4, it says, So Abram went. He went. He went as the Lord had told him. He didn't turn around. He didn't question God. He didn't say, You know what? I don't know. I I think I like where I live. I think I like what's going on here. I think I'll pass on that, God. Thanks so much for the offer, but I'm good. See, Abraham doesn't do that. Abraham goes, and he goes where God is calling him. And this is the type of trust that we are supposed to put in God, right? This is the thing that we're talking about this morning. But that doesn't really give us a good picture of God being trustworthy, right? God made a promise, but if the story ended there, we'd be like, okay, that's great. This man went off and is trusting in God, but we're not sure how this all ends. But you see, the story of Scripture is a continued reminder that God is faithful to his promises. That is what all Scripture points to. You see, there's more times in the life of Abraham where God pretty much tests his faith tests whether or not Abraham truly trusts in him or the things that he is going to give to Abraham. You see, as we continue on in the story, eventually Abraham passes away, right? And God could have easily said, okay, well, you know, I said I was going to bless your family, but Abraham, uh, he passed away, so I'm good. Let's move on. Let's keep going with how, you know, the world is going to work, right? But God doesn't do that, right? You see, God continues to stay faithful to that promise. And eventually in the book of Genesis, right, we come to the story of a boy named Joseph. The story of Joseph is a continual reminder of the faithfulness of God. To save some time this morning, basically what happens is, is Joseph is disliked by his brothers, sold into slavery into Egypt. Eventually Joseph comes into a position of power in Egypt because of his ability to interpret dreams. Eventually he gets brought to Pharaoh. Pharaoh has these dreams about an impending famine that he doesn't know what it means. Joseph is able to interpret those dreams and now Joseph is placed into power. Well, if you take a step back and think about it, who is Joseph's father? Joseph's father is Jacob. Jacob's father is Isaac, and Isaac's father is Abraham. Joseph's father also goes by the name Israel. 
So do you see how the promise that God made to Abraham is continuing on through the lineage of Joseph? Well, see, the story doesn't end there, right? Because there is a famine in the land, but Joseph is able to store up grain for all the people. For seven years, they store up the grain, and as they're doing that, people are taking note. They're like, there's so much, there's plentiful food. Why are you storing up grain? What, what's the point? And then the famine hits, right? And people notice, they're like, oh, Egypt has food. They're able to provide for the people. And so his brothers take note. They go down to Egypt. They ask for grain. They get it. And long story short, Joseph kind of has this moment where he's really not sure what he's going to be doing. But he, in a way, messes with his brother and tries to put the, the fear of God, for lack of a better term, in them. And eventually, he reconciles with his brothers, and the family of Israel come into Egypt. They are brought from a place of destitution into a place of plenty. Do you see how the story of God being faithful to his promise continues through Scripture, right? And it would be great if that's where things ended, right? It's a good place. They've gotten where they're going. But we immediately pick up now into the book of Exodus. And we meet a character by the name of Moses. You see, the family of Israel had entered into the land. They are taken care of, but hundreds of years pass and a new pharaoh comes to power and all of a sudden the people of Israel are not welcome in Egypt anymore. And so the new pharaoh decides, he says, you know what, I'm worried that these Israelites are going to get into all sorts of conflict. They're going to eventually see that a war is coming and they're going to side with our enemies and we are going to be destroyed from the inside out. And so he decides, he says, we need to cut this off at the source. And so he sends out a decree and says, I want all male Israelite children under the age of two to be thrown into the Nile. It's It's a big blow to what's going on in the story of Israel, isn't it? Except for... What man intends for evil, God intended for good. And we're introduced to the character of Moses. You see, but God hasn't called Moses yet. God puts Moses into a position to be able to stand both in the presence of the Egyptians and the presence of the Israelites and be able to speak to both sides with an understanding of what's going on. You see, the thing is, is God again now makes a promise to Moses, right? God has called Moses into leadership to lead his people. And in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, we see the promise that God makes with Moses. He says, uh, Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hands to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Now, Hone in on verse 8 for a second, because I want you to think about how much time has passed now since God has made his promise to Abraham. Remember, just in between the end of the book of Genesis and the beginning of the book of Exodus, it's generally considered to be about 400 years. God not only remembers his promise in the short term, but is remembering his promise in the long term. He says, I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Why is God worthy of our trust? Because he is showing us that he is trustworthy. He's showing us that he doesn't back down on his promises no matter how much time has gone by. And so as God has called Moses into this position of leadership for the people of Israel, we now get the account where the Israelites are leaving Egypt, right? And they go out, they see the ten plagues, the wonders that God has been doing. They are able to see with their own eyes the power of God, and yet almost immediately there are problems. Because almost immediately the people 
seem to lose their trust in God. And they begin to grumble. They begin to say, you know what, I think it might have been better in Egypt. It might have been better because we had pots of meat that we could eat. We had a roof over our heads. And suddenly the Israelites are romanticizing being back in Egypt. And yet they've just seen the full glory of God walking before them as a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of clouds during the day. And yet they're still missing the fact of what is going on before their very eyes. They're missing what's going on. But God continues to bless them. He continues to take care of them. He provides them manna and quail. He's feeding them. He knows that they are upset, and yet he's not just saying, hey, you know what? Never mind. Go back to Egypt. I don't want to deal with you anymore because all you're doing is grumbling about the things that I've already done for you. He doesn't do that. He says, you know what? I got you. It's going to be okay. And so we know that the story goes that Moses takes out his cell phone, puts in Google Maps, promised land, and they get there and everything's great. Well, it doesn't quite go that way. But it's nice to think about. I mean, that would have solved a lot of problems if they had just had cell phones and GPS back then. But you see... Over two years go by, and the Israelites are losing it. They're going, okay, God, you brought us out here. We've been wandering the desert for two years. We don't know where we're going. We're trying to trust in you, but this is really difficult. Maybe we should just go back to Egypt. Maybe, maybe Moses and Aaron, and maybe they don't know what they're talking about. And there's this really interesting moment where even Moses' brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, question his authority and question whether or not they should go back to the land of Egypt. And God has a very interesting response that we don't have time to get into this morning. But if you have time, the book of Numbers is full of great stories and accounts like this. But after two years... The Israelites are now standing on the precipice of entering into the promised land. Right? The land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They can see it with their own eyes. They are right there, and they finally reach their destination. And yet, the Israelites continue to struggle to put their trust in God. At the beginning of Numbers chapter 13, God decides, he says, you know what? I want you, Moses, to send some men in to explore the land of Canaan. I want you to send 12 spies, one leader from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So Moses does this. He chooses the 12. And two of them you might recognize by name. Their names are Joshua and Caleb. And Moses gives them the instructions. He sends them into the land. He says, these are the things that I want you to look for. And so for 40 days, the men are gone. They're in the land. They are exploring. They're figuring out what's going on. They are ready to see if they can enter into the land. And so the, the spies come back. And this is where we're going to pick up in Numbers chapter 13, verse 26. They come back and they are ready to give a report. It says, they came back to Moses and Aaron in the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. So these men are giving a report to Moses and to Aaron, and they're saying, look, here's what's going on, right? And in verse 30, it says, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. 
Caleb is showing his faith. He's saying, look, this is great. God has brought us to the very place that he promised he would bring us. God is true to his promises, and I know that we can do it. But verse 31 changes the narrative. It says, But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And so they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. I kind of struggle with this passage a little bit. Because I tend to think that if I had a visual representation of my very faith standing before me, the land is in front of me, that I would never do that. That I would never think that God wasn't true to his promises because I can see the very thing in front of me. But you see, the problem is that sometimes we become become so blinded by the very thing that we are looking forward to that we don't recognize it when it's standing in front of us. Not to get too off track, but this is the very problem that the Jewish people had when Jesus came to this earth. They didn't see what was right in front of them because they were so anticipating what they thought should be standing right in front of them that they didn't put their faith and trust in God. Now, in Numbers 14, this says verses 5 through 9, but I actually want to start in verse 1 because this report is given, right? The people of Israel have been soured on the promised land, and the 10 spies, right? The 10 have come back and said, There's no way we can go into the land. There's no way we should even try. And so, in 14, verse 1, it says, That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we pass through is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Verse 9, Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. You see, this account is so interesting because, you see, Caleb and Joshua showed true faith because they did not only know that God was in control, but they relied on him to keep his promises. They said, God promised this land to our fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Who are we to stand in opposition of what God has promised because they know that they should trust in God because they have seen how God has led them through the wilderness, how he has time and time again helped them and provided for them. And yet, almost the entire Israelite community, all but three people, right? Caleb, Joshua, and Moses are ready to forget God. They're ready to go back to Egypt. Imagine how difficult that had to have been for Moses. God has called him into a position of power, and he speaks directly to God. God has this relationship with Moses. And even more so, imagine what God must have been feeling, right? But we don't really have to imagine because the book of Numbers actually tells us God has this reaction where he's like, you don't get it, do you? 
And so he says that the older generation that he has now led into this position will not enter into the promised land. And for 40 years, he says the Israelite community will wander the desert. And anyone over the age of 20 will not enter into the promised land except for Caleb and Joshua. Not even Moses himself gets to enter into the promised land. But remember, as Exodus 34 tells us, God's anger only extends three or four generations, but his love is endless. And so the people do get to enter into the promised land. But what I want to do is I want to jump back to Abraham for a second. And I want us to think a little bit more about what it is about his faith that allows us to call him the father of our faith. And I think Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 through 12 does a good job of explaining it for us. It reads, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the sea shore. Now having faith doesn't necessarily promise us you know, endless inheritance and all of these things. But what it does promise us is eternal life, eternal salvation. What it does help us to realize is that when we fully put our trust in God, we become heirs of that same promise. We become heirs of the same promise that God made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So back to this question. So why is this definition of faith so important? Why is it important that we understand this definition of faith? Well, back to this whole analogy of a chair, right? If we know and believe that a chair is a chair, that's great, right? But if we do not trust that the chair will do what it is designed to do, then we are missing an integral part of what the chair is designed for. You see, rather than just knowing the truth... Rather than just knowing the scriptures, rather than just knowing the gospel, we have to start trusting in God to keep his promises. We have to rely on God. We have to put our trust in him. So as we wrap up this morning, I want to leave you with a question. Will you be more like the ten spies that lived or that operated in rebellion to God that said, look, we, we went into the land. We saw what was going on. We know. We saw it with our own eyes. And they put their trust in themselves. Or will you be more like Caleb and Joshua who stood opposed to the rest of the Israelite community and said, no, it doesn't matter what we saw because we saw the same thing. We were all there together. But the difference is, is that we put our trust in the God of heaven and earth, the one who created everything and the one who has brought us out of Egypt through the wilderness and now into the promised land. The question is, will you be more like Caleb and Joshua in your faith? Will you fully trust in God and God alone? Or will you more resemble the rest of the Israelite community? Will you be great at grumbling? Will you be great at looking at the negative things? Or instead, will you stand in recognition of the great and powerful things that God is doing in your lives? And my prayer for you this morning is that you will look more like Caleb and Joshua than you will the other ten spies. Our faith is predicated on two things. 
belief and trust. And this morning, as we end the sermon, I hope and I pray that you will fully put your trust in God and God alone. If there's anything that we can do for you this morning, if you need prayer, if you need um, just someone to talk to, we want to invite you to come forward, uh, see myself, see any one of the elders. I'm going to invite the elders that are here to come forward as well, um, and we'll be happy to help you in any way that we can as we stand and sing this next song. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence, from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send